Hello. So, um, welcome to the Long Patrol for what was the Jets' effect on naval tactics. And before I get into it, I have to make a quick statement. So, if this goes live as planned on Friday, woohoo. But if this is Thursday, there is a reason for this. The assistant, well, the trainee assistant, fluffy research assistant, has managed to pick up pneumonia and is, as I speak, currently being watched very carefully downstairs by my sister while I record this. So I have a video in backup and then we'll swap over. And I'm also on call to rush him to the vets if necessary because I'm the fastest driver in the family. So, at the moment, I have got the fairies blocked out, but I haven't managed to polish it today as I normally do because we've been dealing with this when we're recording this, and I'm recording this on the 26th. Well, I'm recording, it was meant to record this on the 25th, but I'm recording this morning on the 26th. So, it could be. I end up swapping out the live and putting that onto the Friday. And putting this out today, on Thursday. Or, it could be the original plan. I hope it's the original plan. Because I'm really looking forward to doing the fairies. But if not, I wanted to apologize. Sorry about having to swap you around. I know you all understand. And thank you. I'll just say that now. Because I know what my what viewers are like. So, without much further ado. Let's get into the slideshow. So, the effect of the early jet age and how it affected naval strategy and tactics. Patron 11, proposed by Ashnor. This is the Long Patrol. Now, I have to say, when this was first proposed, the big question for me was where I was going to stick the baseline. What I was going to treat as the baseline point, because it's when does the early jet age begin? Do we consider World War II when the jet age began? There are jets. But honestly, they are such a small part of World War II. They're there. But... It's kind of like talking about the Bolton Paul Defiance contribution to the Battle of Britain. Or... HMS Wasp by its contribution to anti-submarine warfare. It happens, but it's not massive. In War Spite's case, it's mostly thanks to a swordfish float plane at Narvik. But, um, you know, it happens. So it's there. It is something you can point to and go, it happens. But it's more of an outlier or a bonus or something extra to talk about rather than the meat, potatoes. Starter, dessert, I don't know, it's the amuse bouche of the cooked meal. So I decided the jet age really starts after World War II. That's when we start absolutely really seeing the jet age impact. Naval aviation and aviation in general starts to have a wider impact after World War II. The transition begins probably at the end of World War II, and that's where we start this, 1945. And I would argue by about 1960, you are fully into the jet age. So I would argue it's a 15-year transition in terms of military aviation. And this does not mean that everyone universally has jets by 1960. It is a long way off, as we know many people are still using propeller-powered aircraft to this day. 
for very sensible reasons. They are very reliable. They're very easy to fly. They can carry a huge amount of weight of weight compared to their own uh, their own sort of engine weight and their own aircraft weight. And more importantly, they often come with a long loiter time, which is incredibly useful for close air support. But jets are faster. You can make them far more efficient in terms of fuel consumption. So they can give you a longer range and a longer reach matters as a carrier. And the cleaner front of a jet allows you to get a far better radar return on a small radar. There is a reason why when you see a, an airborne early warning aircraft, a carrier based one, which has propellers, the radar is either massive and still mounted as far away from propellers as it can get. Or is massive and still mounted as far away from propellers as it can get. Can't really think of one which hasn't either been mounted above or below and away from the propellers. There's one we're going to be looking at in a bit in this one, and yeah. Mounted away from the propellers. Definitely. So, how? what's the baseline? Well, the baseline I decided to use was air defense at sea. And there's a reason for picking air defense at sea. Air defense at sea comes with this very nice topical thing by the end of World War II. It's the big blue blanket, which is often talked about in quite a lot of popular histories. Whereas, if you're talking about air strike, the most famous strikes in World War II from the sea are Taranto and Pearl Harbor. They do a lot, lot more than that in World War II, but I'm sorry, have a look. And you can say technology changes, but does the tactics change, really? Mm. Try and surprise your enemy somehow. Drop as many bombs as accurately as you can. Get out before the enemy fighters can kill you. Yeah, it, it, it's really quite straightforward. So, technological leading edge in 1944 45 is air defense at sea. Now, Often it's talked about as the big blue blanket. We talk about a guy called Commander John Fack. And this is the person who came up with the Fack Weave, which was a very good way of allowing wildcats or martlets as they were at that time in British service. Wildcats better, but martlet does sound cool. Um to take out zeros. And one of the best minds of generation. Now he officially comes up with this in 43, 44, and it's implemented in 44, 45. And the idea is you have American picket warships, usually destroyers, but also cruisers and frigates. Sometimes they're Commonwealth, Australian, Canadian, Royal Navy. Would use radar to detect incoming Japanese aircraft. They would then radio the position and course of the incoming aircraft to the American fighters. With the condo of air control and the cap, and those fighters would then intercept and try and shoot down the Japanese aircraft before they got within range of anything, anything important. And most of the time, it worked pretty darn well. 
There's just one problem with talking about this as being a revelatory system when it comes up. It is a good system. It is a very good system. Not a revelatory system, though. In fact, none of them are. This is the British system. As mentioned above, the uh, Fighter Direction Office was officially laid out to provide a quick and efficient means to communicate with the CAT, coordinate the CAT. The four channel wireless system allowed a single radio channel to dedicate to radar sightings of incoming planes and a second channel to be dedicated to fleet sightings. This system allowed for different dissemination of sightings to fighters in the CAT. The CUSN system relied heavily on radio since the since due to surprise being of utmost importance in carrier-to-carrying battles, and because the Japanese had an efficient radio direction finding system, this forced the USN to use different radio sets and many different radar sets within the carrier to uh, carrier group to detect the enemy, and use VHF sets that were restricted to a line of sight radius. Once a red raid was detected. The entire system was switched to a medium frequency, all of which was communicated through radio transmissions. The problem with this system was that other radio traffic was also transmitted over the same frequencies of the two sets, causing a lot of traffic over one channel. Well, for starters, it seems that the Americans do have a fighter control system in place when HMS Robin, or USS Robin, otherwise known as HMS Victorious, goes to the Pacific in 1942, which doesn't sound that bad, but sounds kind of similar to what, not quite as complete, perhaps, as the Big Blue Blanket, but also it suggests the British have a system, and I can go with through the British system for you, that's, you know, the British idea was at the beginning of the war, they were hoping to have escorts with radar on, and do the whole coordination thing through the fighter, but quite often at the beginning of the war, the carriers were built with radar, especially the armoured carrier, hangar, armoured carriers, or the illustrious class armoured hangar carriers, before Jamie tracks me down and hurts me, and uh, that's Jamie C. Dale of armouredcarriers.com, where this quote comes from. Um, he would start off with their radar, they're also the highest ship in the fleet, so the radar could see the furthest. Often, and they, their radar would look around, they'd spot the enemy coming in, and they'd tell the cat where to go. Interesting thing, British two-seater fighters tended to have better endurance and longer range than their American single-seat cannon compadres. Could actually, therefore, A, thanks to having a reserver for navigation, could fly further away to set up the cap, and therefore could be further up threat. But when you have your radar set is coordinated from the back, that doesn't always help. But it does mean the American ones were faster to gain height. So with the British scenario, the cap you had in the air was what you had to fight the battle. Anything else you launched was probably not going to get enough altitude in time before the attack arrived. With the Americans, there was always a chance that the alert fighters would also manage to intercept the incoming attack. So, you know, swings and roundabouts with all these things. The Americans just had to rotate their cap far more often. Which did more wear on aircraft, because as we know, the thing that wears aircraft out the most in a carrier operations are the landings. People talk about takeoff. That's that that's bad on the airframe, yes, but nothing is quite as damaging as control crash for an airframe. Nothing is quite as damaging. Again, another reason why the Americans, despite them often being listed as having larger numbers of air groups, of course carry a lot of spare aircraft in that numbers, but one of the interesting things was they were found to often have... Uh, how do I put this? Their air groups dropped off quicker than the British did in terms of serviceability of aircraft. 
their engineers tried miracles, they did miracles. But there is a reason you look at the size of the aircraft air group, and then you look at the strike size after they've been operating for a couple of weeks at sea, and you're suddenly looking and going, well, hang on, you theoretically have an air group 50% larger than the British one. And the British one's launching a larger attack group than you, and they've, you've been operating side by side for longer, for the same amount of time. In fact, the British one's been slightly on service for longer. What's happened? Well, it's, it's aircraft wear. It's maintaining and repairing aircraft. The British have, usually as I said, have these longer endurance cap aircraft. Fireflies later in the war, full miles at the beginning of the war. And... They also have these extra, these far, far more heavy duty maintenance shops built into their sh and maintenance facilities and t workshops built into their, sh into their carriers. And those places have some level of protection as well, which is always fun. So that allows for a lot of aircraft operation. And that affects how Britain starts to adopt jet aircraft. Because, again, the Royal Navy is not a small navy in this period we're talking about. In one of the decades we're going to be talking about, they launch six aircraft carriers. Six aircraft carriers. Yes, those are hulls which were started in World War II, but they have entered into service six aircraft carriers in a decade. They or they maintain another. They have some already still in service, and they refitted others. You know. Well, okay. Um, the Royal Navy, as I said, is not doing badly. They will do, they'll send five carriers to the Suez Crisis. They'll keep a carrier permanent on station during the Korean War. They will do all sorts of things in this period. So, yes, I'm not claiming they're the largest navy in the world. And that means they have to put a lot more thought sometimes into what they're doing, because... If it goes wrong, there are far bigger repercussions for them than necessarily for the U.S. Navy. So, but they aren't also so small as to be insignificant. It's one of those interesting things when you start talking about it and people go, they look at the current size of the Royal Navy and most people don't seem to realise the cliff edge the Royal Navy sort of drops off in the 60s. In the late 60s, as numbers start to really go down. As the focus becomes, for all sorts of strategic reasons, which are logical, it just you have to you either agree with them or you disagree with them. Depends how much precedent you put on them. And the British Army of the Rhine became the focus. I think there is no surprise that this though happens to the Royal Navy after this man retires. Admiral on the fleet, Sir Caspar John. If we consider his career, during World War II, he spends time in America. He's one of the officers buying aircraft for the fleet air arm from America and a few other things as well he's doing out there. Uh, he is the captain for HMS Pretoria Castle, which is an escort carrier. He's then the captain of HMS Ocean. 
one of the light fleet carriers. We'll be talking about her a lot later. She's also the aircraft carrier, which is used for the first ever jet landing and takeoffs from a carrier. So, um, you know, not, a, not an unprestigious post. Then he's the commander of HMS Fulmar, which is the RNA for RAF, what is now RAF Lossy Mouth. Deputy Chief of Naval Air Equipment, 1949. Director of Air Organization and Training, 1950. Flag Officer, 3rd Aircraft Carrier Squadron and Heavy Squadron of the Home Fleet, 1951-52. Deputy Controller of Aircraft at the Ministry of Supply, 52-4. Flag Officer, Air, Home at HMS Daedalus. That's the Royal Navy Air Station at Leon Solent, closed in 1996. And the Vice Chief of Naval Staff, 1957-60. And first Sea Lord, nineteen sixty to sixty three. He had been one of those pilots during the interwar years for the Fleet Air Arm, one of the first Royal Navy pilots to really go through. He has a wonderful career, and there is a wonderful book which I've talked about before, which he was writing his own autobiography, then he dies, and his daughter Rebecca finishes it off, turning into the version we see today. He is Mr. Naval Aviation. Post-Second World War, he is... If you consider the fleet air arm that comes into being in 1939-1940 is Admiral Henderson's creation. He's the one who's argued for it, pushed for it, got it built, got it procured, all those sort of things. The, na uh, the naval uh, fleet air arm during World War II is in many ways pushed for by Lumley Lister, but is also in many respects a ground-up rather than a top-down creation in that there's a lot of different officers running around, and there's a lot of senior officers, and it's, there's a lot of momentum going behind aviation, naval aviation being built, and therefore you don't have to make so much of a case for it. You're building it because its need is obvious. Escort carriers are painfully obvious need. Strike aircraft and fighter aircraft for your aircraft carriers to cover your fleets in the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean, the Pacific, the North Atlantic are blisteringly obvious in front of you. You're not, you don't have to do the same rigorous fighting. After World War II, a lot of those officers who had been so involved, retire. And, of course, Admiral Cunningham, this is Andrew, dies. John Cunningham is a good officer. Not a great one, and not the level of politician you need for a naval officer to win the battles in Whitehall that are going on in this period. That is mostly left up to Casper John and Philip Vian. There is a reason both of those end up as being admirals of the fleet. Philip Vian makes the case for naval aviation, is very, very keen on that, but also makes the case for the surface fleet. Casper John makes the case for naval aviation, the carriers, and also to an extent the, the case for the submarine service as well, although he never served them, but he sort of considers the two, the, uh, the two sides of the same coin. You know, I, I think he has this theory that, you know, you. Perhaps I just said, you know, I do apologize. Um, that if you have a powerful enough air group on a carrier to push back the maritime air patrols and the anti-submarine warfare patrols, it frees the submarines to be far more offensive 
than if they have to constantly worry about snooping aircraft. It's not something which is, you know, I don't know. The theory of everything. It's fairly straightforward tactically, but it's fairly difficult to work out how you deal with because to send a strike group to the guards and find the carriers, they will have to go through the, well, the carrier battle group, they'll have to go through the submarines to send out the enemy submarine, uh, submarine units to take out the submarines, they will have to deal with the aircraft from the carriers. Kind of puts your most enemies in a catch-22. He likes long-range, fast strike aircraft. The Buccaneer is a product of his mind and his pushing. CVA-01 was definitely his pushing. Phantom was of his pushing. But so was pretty much everything else beforehand. If you look at the those posts, he is either in Whitehall or close enough to be able to call into Whitehall pretty much for... Well, barring his time on Cat H Mutation, uh, the last 16 years of his naval career. And again, that's no surprise because. Oh, we're having this debate today. Are we having this minister who's having trouble understanding why I need an aircraft carrier? Oh, yes, the third. Oh, the, uh, the uh, flag officer, third aircraft carrier squadron. Oh. Would you like to be here? Yes. He would have a go at flying anything, and quite often did. He was, in many ways, even worse than Henderson to that regard, because Henderson at least didn't turn up at manufacturers airfields and go, oh, is that the new aircraft? I'll have a go in it. There are stories about... Well, the thing is, there are stories, but there aren't really confirmed stories, so... I can't go into... I can't say this concretely happened, but there are... Mm, strong rumours, let's say. Mummerings I've heard from multiple sources separate enough that I would consider them to have some bearing, that him and Eric Winkle Brown, of course, who have did the jet landings first ever on Casper John's carrier, Ocean, were very good friends. And occasionally, because they are both very good pilots, um... Winkle Brown would find himself with a very, very senior co-pilot in an aircraft which was a two-seater. When testing it. Just to see if it flew right, you know? So, what are the tactics at the end of World War II? What are the tactics? Because... This is the product at the end of World War II. This is the naval officer who's been fire-hardened through the politics and the conflict of World War II, has fought in Norway, has been working in America, has been all around the world doing all sorts of things. This is the naval aviation officer. One of the two who are making the case, the one who will be making the case most loudly and for longest about Navy elevation. So what do I have to, to make the case for? At this stage in development of naval aviation, the accent was still seen to be on air superiority. 
It was deemed essential that the Navy should have aircraft faster, or at least as fast, as any enemy aircraft which might be encountered. The gun was still the only weapon for use against other aircraft, and not until the air-to-air -air missile became a reliable weapon would need for the performance priority give way to the concept that what was really needed was an aircraft that was a good weapons platform, with both adequate radar and payload. Indeed, the comparative method of merits of air superiority versus weapon-carrying aircraft is still argued today. Desmond Wetton, as always, incredibly correct and on point. Tactics at the end of World War II were refined, but they are also divided in that the RN has a powerful fleet of fighting carriers fighting out in the Pacific, it has escort carriers deployed around the world looking after convoys, and it has escort carriers deployed around the world in with air groups configured in a strike form. It has the Blackburn Firebrand, developed originally from a fighter which was going to defend naval air bases, land air bases, but then they decided they could turn it into a sea base, as carrier based torpedo carrying air, torpedo loaded um, armed single seater attack aircraft, which could also have the power and speed to be a fighter. Um, does anyone else? heard someone talking about a single seat, single engined, will do everything aircraft. I'm sure that's not a concept which is still around to this day. Must be mistaken. And here's an example of some of the issues. So John Cunningham had 1946. The Minister of Out Portfolio questioned the need for a Pacific fleet. The size contemplated having in regard to the fact of friendly power and not a potential enemy now dominates the ocean. Sir John Gunningham pointed out that although there might be no potential enemy battle fleet, there are plenty of potentially hostile submarines, and a vast area in which there were very, many very important British interests. This is the final point about naval aviation. A battle fleet is always assessed by the enemy it's going to fight a battle against. Naval aviation is not so simplistic. If you're shelling something from a ship, it's pretty much war. It is. Somehow we regard punitive airstrikes, though, as not quite war when they're waged on a weak enough target. I don't know why, but they aren't. So, out of that, you can have aircraft overflights, you have anti submarine operations in peacetime and in wartime, you have the intelligence and gathering capacity that the carrier gives you with its ability to watch large areas of ocean thanks to its aircraft. You have the unpredictability a carrier gives you, and that it can move anywhere, eh, anywhere on seven tenths of the world's surface, and its aircraft can turn up anywhere. And the flexibility it gives you in terms of that the rapid deployment, i.e., the aircraft turn up with all the infrastructure to support them for a long-term operation. It's not just a dash and splash operation. I, we dash to an airfield, we get a splash of fuel there, we take off and we can attack, and then we have to head home. It's a, we can turn up and we can sustain operations for weeks, for months. Especially when you have something like HMS Unicorn popping around, which is still popping around at the time of the Korean War. As is Pioneer and Perseus. But they're for later. So, 
I have just decided looking at the time as it's 35 minutes, I'm going to divide this long patrol into multiple parts to make it easier to digest. So thank you very much for staying with me for part one of, I have a feeling of four. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope to see you in the subsequent parts. If you have enjoyed, please do remember to press like, maybe subscribe, perhaps even press that little bell down there. Join the Discord, also a link down below, or if you're feeling very generous, patron. You get to go and look at the slides, and most importantly, you get to suggest topics like this one, and vote for which topics will, will like this one will be selected. So basically, it's a two-stage process. The patrons suggest a whole load of topics. I then pick six to eight of them, put them to vote. Those are the six to eight I think I can best do in that month. Sometimes, like the one which is the um, paddle-wheeled warships topic coming up, it's a case of, I really like that idea, but I can't do it in one month. So I nick it from the topics. And then I put it on a few months later. Once I've had enough time to research it. It's coming up in December. It's going to be fun. Thank you. Take care.